hope you can all see me. Um, first of all, thank you to Dr. Edwards and the rest of the brass faculty here for having me. I'm really excited to be here. It's kind of really crazy to be in this room, you know, all these years later because I used to take classes in here. The way we're going to approach today might be a little different from what you're used to. I really want this to just feel like a conversation rather than a lecture. So I want all of us participating, all of us asking questions. You know, I'm here to help you guys out. I'm here to help you. So I'm just going to give a quick rundown of what I've done so far, you know, my journey from music student at ASU to where I am now as a professional musician. Um, and then I'm going to ask all of you a few questions just so I can get a read of the room, get a feel for where you all are at. And then I'm just going to open up the Q&A right away. So this entire conversation will be guided by your questions. I do have a lot of notes here on the stuff I want to cover, but I'm hoping we can like work that in to answering your questions. So my name is Lisa Lizanic chapel My musical journey, I started as most people do playing music. I took piano lessons when I was younger. Um, then I started band in elementary school. And after a brief, brief stint with the saxophone, I actually played clarinet for a really long time. Um, clarinet was my first instrument, and it wasn't until I got to high school when they were looking for more trombones to join the marching band that I was like, I think I can try that. I think I can do that. So I started playing trombone in high school for the marching band. I completely taught myself how to do it. You know, I locked myself in a room with one of those, you know, standard of excellence books and just read through each page and just kind of figured it out. Um, so in high school, I was obsessed with marching band. I loved it. It was amazing. I loved playing trombone. I felt like much more of a connection with that instrument than the clarinet. I could just tell I was like, this is my instrument. This is so cool. And then in band class, getting to sit in the back with all the trombone players, I was like, these are my people. <laughs> you know, I just loved it. Um, so honestly, being really into marching band, yeah. I got really into drum corps. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. yeah, drum corps. <laughs> okay. I um, did five years of drum corps. Um, troop, I know, it's crazy. Really? Trust me, that's insane. Uh, I did Troopers, Blue Stars, and then three years at Blue Devils. So, do we have people in here who do drum corps? Raise your hands. Where are you at? Where, where you guys march? I work Blue Star this summer. Nice! Yeah. Oh, which share the same one? Academy. Academy. So you know Lisa Tatum. I love Lisa. Lisa Tatum, Tatum is a very good friend of mine. She's the brass caption head at Academy now. She is amazing. She's great. She's great. Okay, uh, so drum corps. Um, then I came to ASU to do my music ed degree. And as Dr. Erickson said, at that time in my life, you know, I wasn't taking things too seriously, um, as I'm sure some of you younger students can relate to. You know, how, where are our freshmen and sophomores in here? Yeah. yeah, you guys are young, I get it. So, you know, at that point in my life, I was doing my music ed degree. In 2008, so this was towards the end of my music education degree, I got the opportunity, a job offer, to be in a show called Odyssey, Brass Angels, which is where I met Lisa Tatum. <laughs> um, and so it was the staff of the Blue Devils that created this project, um, and it was run by Minon Concert Association, which is a nonprofit organization in Japan. So I was, gosh, 20, 21 years old at the time, and I got this opportunity to get paid to go to Japan and tour for five months. I was like, okay, you know. So obviously I had to take some time off from school to do that. So I went to Japan, performed every night, was in this huge show, went on tour. Like, I, let's just say I had the time of my life. It was great. Um, but that was like really what sealed the deal for me. I was like, okay, I want to perform for a living. This is amazing. I want to live this life. So I came back to ASU, and at that point, I only had one semester left, just my student teaching. So I was like, well, I've made it this far. You know, I should finish it out and get my degree. So I got my music ed degree. And then I kind of hit a crossroads where, you know, because I had this amazing performance experience in Japan, and I had this music ed degree, and I didn't really want to be a band teacher. So I actually worked outside of the music field for a little bit, because I just I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. Um, but that didn't last long, you know, obviously there was a huge void in my life because I love music and I really wanted to perform. So I decided to go back to get my master's degree. But I definitely think like taking that little bit of time away from music really like helped me solidify like that that's what I wanted to do. So, and I knew if that's what I wanted to do, perform for a living, that I had to refine my skills. You know, I had to get better, I had to put more time in, kind of make up for that time that I maybe didn't put in 
earlier during my music ed degree or the fact that I only started playing trombone in high school and I taught myself how to do it. You know, so I knew I had to kind of make up for lost time and really hit it hard. So when I went back for my master's degree, I feel like I was like a new woman. I was like super serious about school. I was practicing all the time. I was just like really gung ho. At that point, I would say that's like when I went all in. And we'll talk about that later. Like you have to go all in. Back in my master's degree, that it was then where I started freelancing more around town. Um, definitely started playing a lot of gigs. After one year of my master's degree, I got another job offer to be in the show called Blast. Do you guys know? Nice. Yeah. So I got offered the job with Blast, and this was longer than the previous tour I did. This was a year and a half long contract. So um, the tour was United States, Korea, and then again, Japan. Um, I thought really long and hard about it because I felt like I had gone on such a journey to come to the conclusion that I wanted to go back to school, that I wanted to get my master's degree. And so I was actually like going back and forth, like, should I do this? You know, should I finish my degree? And at the end of the day, of course, I chose the job. Uh, um, so I had, again, took some more time off from school. You know, I took a year and a half off from school this time. And honestly, when I left to go do this job, I, I wasn't sure if I was going to come back. You know, I just didn't know where life was going to take me. So I did this tour of Blast. It was great. Um, I definitely think I leveled up there in many ways. Just being around so many other amazing professional musicians and learning from my peers. You know, learning from the people around me. A lot of them were a lot more experienced than me at that point with performing and the gigs they were doing and just the freelance side of it and their businesses and how they were running everything. So I learned a lot from that tour. Not to mention just the consistency of when you have to perform every night. You know, when you go on tour, or you're doing a show, or you're in an organization where you have to perform every single day, you figure it out. You know, there is no, I'm tired today, or oh, my chops hurt today. It's like, no, you, you just gotta figure it out, and you have to create the same product every night. So I really feel like I learned that during that time. Actually, during the tour, I got an email from Douglas Yeo, who was the then trombone professor at ASU. And we had never met before, but he was like, well, you know, I'd really like you to come back and finish your degree. And I'll be honest, if it wasn't for Doug Yeo reaching out to me, I, I might not have come back. I might not have came back and finished. So I was really happy to hear from him. I came back, finished my master's. It was a very positive experience. I, it was a great experience. So grateful for it. But after that tour of Blast, when I came back, it was like I was also a different person to everyone in everyone else's eyes. Like my freelance game around town went from like sometimes to like full time. It was like I was, you know, getting a lot of different jobs and I had no problem finding work. I feel like sometimes all it takes is one big thing on your resume to really kind of like put you to the next level. And I mean, you can always keep adding and keep going up with all the gigs you get. But um, so that was, I found that like that was a necessary thing, like sometimes being attached to bigger things or bigger organizations. So after I graduated with my master's, for the next three years, I was living and working in Phoenix. So I would go back and forth between Phoenix and then going to Japan for tours with Blast. Because at that point, the last Blast tour in the US was in 2011. At that point, from that point on, it's only been in Japan. And they've been putting on tours almost every year. So I would go to Japan, come back, go to Japan, come back. Um, during my time in Phoenix, yeah, I was like freelancing full time. I did teach private lessons a little bit too. So, uh, but my main jobs here in Phoenix was, um, I was a principal trombone at Arizona Broadway Theater out in Peoria. Have any of you guys been out there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they do Broadway style shows full time. I mean, they're on a Broadway schedule, eight shows a week. So that was a really good way to not only have consistent work, but to just, like my show repertoire just went up. It was like show after show after show after show. So it was really great for me to be able to experience playing that many different musical theater shows. Um, another big company I worked for here in Phoenix, they're called Tad Management. They do a lot of like production shows, like tribute shows, concert stuff. Um, they have a lot of work, um, that company. And then I also played in the local music scene. <laughs> um, I played in a lot of bands around town. Um, the main one I was in, uh, they're called the Hourglass Cats. I still play with them. Just like recording albums, going on tour. Like Phoenix actually has a super big uh, like local music scene with a lot of great bands. You know, bouncing back and forth um, between Japan, like I said. In 2016, I had the opportunity to move to Japan. So the past three and a half years, I've actually been living there. 
And, you know, I've always had my work with Blast. The production company that does Blast in Japan is called Kyoto Tokyo Inc. Um, so I continued to work with Blast, but now that I was living in Japan, I got to do a lot more. So I was part of the show from the beginning to the end. I got to do um, all the promotional recordings, so like go into the studio and like play all the trombone parts that they would use for the TV commercials and all the you know events and stuff. I got to be in the TV commercials and the the print work, like all the photos, you know, for posters and everything. I then got to do the promo tours, which included you know going, doing like radio stuff and TV and live performances, all that. Yes, it was in Japanese, so that's a whole other story of my struggles <laughs> to learn Japanese. Yeah, it was great to, I had never seen like that business side of it before, really seeing like how much work goes into a show. Have any of you guys seen the shows that come through in Gamage, the musicals that come in? So it's like what you see on that day is that finished product. But the production company was probably working on that show for a year before it ever hit the stage. You know, like think of all the marketing and all that that goes into it. So. That was really cool for me to see that other side of the music business, you know, everything that happens before the show even hits the stage. So I was able to do that with Blast and then some other shows that Kyoto um, Tokyo Inc. produced. Um, I also, while I was over there, was in the Japanese premiere of Mary Poppins, like in the pit orchestra, and that was like a trombone and euphonium duo, duo book. So thank you, Drum Corps, for uh, teaching me how to play the euphonium, you know? So you never know, you might use that stuff in the future again. So yeah, and then just other, you know, playing with other bands and ensembles while I was there. Um, now I'm back in Arizona for a little bit. This is actually my hometown, so visiting friends and family, and of course playing while I'm here. And then after this, uh, I'm going to Florida for rehearsals at Carnival Entertainment Studios, and I'm going to be doing a cruise ship contract this summer in the Caribbean, which I'm super excited about because I've never been to the Caribbean before. So. It's gonna be a fun summer. But yeah, that's just a little bit about me, what I've done so far, you know, kind of my transition from music student to professional musician. So let me ask you all a few questions. How many, um, how many grad students are in here right now? Okay, quite a few. Uh, so undergrad, well the rest of you, sorry, I probably shouldn't ask that. How many of you are music performance majors? Nice, a lot. Uh, music ed majors? Uh, any other majors? Raise your hand. What are you doing? Musicology. Musicology, okay. Music therapy. Music therapy. Uh, music theory. Music theory, okay, cool. All right, so we got a wide range here of, you know, all sorts of different stuff. All right, so I'm gonna open it up to you guys. Who has questions? Yes. So you um, obviously had like two kind of big breaks, and both times you just sort of got it off this, and I got off this job. Could you talk more about if you applied, if you were auditioning, like how that all worked out for you? The actual uh, audition process, or like if someone reached out to you and offered to Oh, you? sure, um, for those two jobs. For the Odyssey, the first one in 2008, someone just reached out to me. Like I said, the show was created by the staff of the Blue Devils, which I was a part of. Um, and the cast was also all female. They wanted an all female cast. So definitely it was just the Blue Devils staff kind of like trickling down their list in, in their head of like, who is a you know a female musician that we know who so they kind of just reached out to me but they already knew how I can play yeah. or how I could play and we'll get in more like into that more later that's like the importance of networking right like especially if you're gonna be freelancing a lot of it is there is no audition you know your audition is your entire body of work up into that point or like somebody knowing how you play with blast it was a friend of mine named Paula Monique, she's a trumpet player, that I met in that Odyssey show um, that reached out to me saying that, that I would be a good fit for Blast and I should send in a tape. I did send in a tape for that one, so I did go through the audition process and then I was selected. So. Was from the tape or was there a live audition as well? No, no live audition, it, it was from a tape. Yeah. So, did that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. Just out of curiosity, did you have to do things besides just play on the tape? Oh yeah, definitely. So for Blast, have you guys seen the show? Yeah. Familiar with it? For those who haven't seen it, it's, it was kind of like the I original idea was like drum corps or marching band, kind of like in the theater. You know, there are elements of, bra it's all brass and percussion, so brass percussion, but there's a lot of acting elements into it. You know, it's just more of like a theatrical event. There's lighting and costume changes and stuff like that. Yeah, so my tape for Blast, I had to play, it was like a variety of musical styles. I had to demonstrate like marching and playing. 
like I had to choreograph something. They asked you to like choreograph a piece of music and move and play at the same time. I also had to sing and I also had to do acting clips. So it was quite an extensive audition process. Yeah. I have another question. Sure. Great question. So they call it the music scene, right? It's like, you gotta be seen. Just go to shows. Like literally, like you can look up, I mean, especially with the internet now, like you can just, there are live shows happening all around this city at any night of the week. Just go out there, watch a show. And if you see a band you like, go up to them afterwards. Tell them you liked their set, you know, say, what instrument do you play? Trumpet. Trumpet, yeah. Say like your set, like, do you need a trombone player? And honestly, a lot of local bands are always looking for horn players. You know, trumpet, trombone, sax. Sorry, horns, I haven't seen any horn players yet, but you never know. You never know. There was this band, Dry River Yacht Club, a local Phoenix band, and they had um, a bassoon player and like a bass clarinet, but all sorts of crazy stuff, so you never know. Um, but yeah, you just, you have to go out, you have to introduce yourself to people. You know, if you utilize social media or have a website or something, you know, just go up to them and say, hey, I loved your set. Can I jam with you sometime? Can I play with you sometime? Just, you just gotta go up to people. The way I kind of started getting involved in the local scene was I subbed for somebody on a gig. And then when I was subbing with this other band, there were members of another band in the audience. They saw me and they were like, hey, come play in our band, you know? So it's, it really is just putting yourself out there and networking and going to shows, going out, which kind of leads me into something. How many of you watch musical events off campus? Okay, great, cool. When you go watch those musical events off campus, do you go talk to anybody afterwards? Depends on the show. Depends yeah. on the show? Yeah, the environment, right? If we're like at like the symphony or something, it might be hard to track somebody down, right? No matter what kind of musical event it is, try your best to go talk to somebody. Like, I told you I did a lot of pit orchestra work. I have literally gone up to the pit orchestra during intermission or something and like peeked my head over and like, well, are you the trombone player? Oh, sound good. You know, like, you can find those moments. It might be awkward, right? It might be weird to go up to somebody that you don't know and go introduce yourself or, but you know, everybody likes compliments, right? So if you go up to a musician and congratulate them on their work, say you like the show, say you like the way they play, like, they're gonna be appreciative, you know? So start thinking of that. Like, you need to let people know you were there. You need to um, let them know you enjoyed their performance. And if you're trying to play with them, yeah, hey, can I play in your band? Or if it's more of a, like what I did in the musical theater example I was saying, I said, do you ever need a sub? Do you need a sub sometimes, you know? So start to make those connections now. Like, there should be a blurry line in between now this is for performance as well as music, music educators. You know, you can start getting music education opportunities now too. It's like there should be a blurry line between when you graduate school and when you start working. You know what I mean? Don't wait till graduation day to be like, oh, okay, well, what am I gonna do for work? Or like, what job am I gonna get, right? So if you're a performance major, start thinking about, you know, start playing those gigs now. Which brings me to something else I definitely want to talk about, something that you all should be working on now if you haven't yet. It's the idea of goal setting, you know? So you need to start thinking about what you want your career to look like. And I would say don't even do goal setting based on like your professional career. I'm talking about like life goals. Like seriously, take the time to think about it and you can be as imaginative and like over the top as you want. Think about it, like what is your dream, do what is your dream job? You know, are you playing principal trumpet in a symphony orchestra? Are you the best high school band director that ever existed? Are you on tour with a rock band in China? You know, it's like, I don't know. Well, not right now. Sorry, that was a bad example. <laughs> Sorry, that was a really bad example. Okay, Sorry. That was funny. But you get my point. Be as crazy and over the top as you want. And then I'll start thinking about where do I want to live? You know, what city do you want to live in? Or what country do you want to live in? What kind of house do you want? What do you want your work hours to be like? You know, you, you really can like picture what your exact, not only career goals are, but life goals. And then once you have that idea, you can kind of work backwards on how to get there. 
you know, so this goes hand in hand with the like going out and being seen thing. You know, if you want to be a <coughs> classical performer, yeah, go to those <coughs> symphony concerts and reach out to the, you know, top players in your area. You know, same thing with music ed. Find the best band directors in the state and reach out to them. Go work for them or just go watch them, right? It's kind of that idea of you need to know your goals and then just start getting out there. Start doing it now. So, yes? Cruise ships. How does someone, if someone's like, hey man, I'd like to work on cruise ships, how, how do you start that? Who do you contact? Who contacted you? Sure. Well, I went through an agency. Landau Music is the agency I use. There are a few others out there. The big one is Pro Ship. I know that's another really big agency. I do know other people who have contacted the cruise lines directly, um, like the different companies, Royal Caribbean, Carnival, Norwegian. Um, but when you contact a cruise line directly, you're obviously only applying to that cruise line. Whereas if you go through an agency, they have access to all the cruise lines. There's a lot of jobs <laughs> with the cruise ships. It's pretty crazy how many jobs are available. Um, but what I had to do was, again, there's no live audition. You send in a tape. They used to do it over the phone. <laughs> or sometimes they'll do it where it's um, like a Skype call or something. And so they'll be giving you the audition, but then you film yourself and then you have to like send the video later. What I did with Lando, I just did it by myself, but you have to like show the, there's like a computer system where you like press a button at a certain time and then you have to like show your camera to the computer. So it says, so they know that, cause the audition's all sight reading. That's the thing. So it's like, they know that they, you send you the music and you just gotta do it. So is there anyone who is interested in that kind of opportunity, yeah, some people. So yeah, it, it's all sight reading, it's all done over the phone. If you have more questions about that, you can ask later. I, mean, I can go deeper into it, but yeah. Uh, so what was kind of going through your mind when you had to choose between taking the jobs and staying in school? Hmm, that's a good question. When I left during my um, undergraduate degree, it wasn't as hard as a decision. Yeah, I was a lot younger then, so you know, I just said yes. I, you know, It wasn't that big of a, I was just kind of like in awe by the opportunity. I'm like, yeah, this sounds awesome, let's do it. But when I left my master's degree, that was a lot more difficult of a decision because, like I said, I had invested so much time in deciding to go back. Also, I was gone for so long that I had to drop out because I, I think, maybe it's different now, but I think it's like you can take two semesters off, but I couldn't take three. I, I remember that was my experience. I was just weighing my, my pros and cons, you know? I was trying to think what was gonna be better for me in the long run. And going back to that idea I said of like having your goals in mind. Because if you have your goal in mind, that's gonna um, affect every decision you make, right? Because the big picture is your big goal. <coughs> and then you work backwards on how to get there. And I knew my goal was to perform, to be a performer, to make money playing my instrument. So when I put it in those terms, it really wasn't a hard decision, if, if that makes sense, yeah. you know what I mean? Because it's, I knew school was always gonna be there, but if I turned down that job opportunity, like I might not be where I am today. Mm -hmm. So it was a hard decision, and you know, after you make big decisions like that, I'm sure some of you know, there's a big trickle-down effect, right? <laughs> like, okay, if I make this decision, that means I have to drop out of school and then I have to move out of my place and then I have to, you know, so there's certainly, when we make those big decisions, there's a lot that happens mm -hmm. afterwards. But uh, to answer your question, it's just going with what your goals are. That, that, I think that will always give you the clarity to make those big decisions. Is, is this helping me achieve my end goal? So, Thank you. Yeah. I guess kind of in a similar vein to that, what was going through your mind like through those couple of years after your undergraduate that you like took off either from music as a whole or just like, well, how closely related were you still with the horn during that time? Okay, good question. So after I came back and yeah, graduated with my music ed degree, what was going through my mind was just this kind of turmoil. Like I said, I had decided that I did not want to be a band teacher, you know, and I had this like music ed degree and a teaching certificate like sitting in my hand, you know, it's like I could have went out that very day and gotten a job being a band teacher. You know, so there was a lot of confusion there, you know, thinking like, oh my gosh, should I just waste four and a half years of my life? You know, so I, I definitely was confused about that. And then having those visions in the back of my head of, you know, this amazing performing experience in Japan, like how great that was. 
And then thinking of like, am I never gonna have that again? Like, was that my, my peak? You know, did I peak at 21 years old and the rest is all downhill, you know? So all of those things. I started working in retail management. Um, I had always worked in retail part-time throughout college, you know, to pay bills. So that I, it was just like an easy job that I just picked up, but I was still playing. I don't know if any of you know um, or are familiar with MCC. Do any of you know Rob Hunter? Yeah, Rob has been a huge like influence for me throughout my life and he's always helped me out. So he was the one who kind of got me back on track. Even though I wasn't in school, I was going over to MCC and like playing in their band and um, Rob was giving me teaching or playing opportunities to like, even though I wasn't enrolled over there, I was, you know, hanging out and playing. And then I also, to prepare for, to come back to ASU, I started taking private lessons with one of the graduate students here at the time. And, so I wouldn't say that I ever wasn't playing my horn, you know what I mean? It was just like, I didn't know what I wanted to do for a living, if that makes sense. So, yeah. Yeah. Kind of going off of what you kind of mentioned earlier about those big decisions affecting your like personal life, like where you live, how do you deal with that? Like you've had, you have this cruise ship job coming up. How do you deal with like real life, where you live and where you're gonna move to? And, that sounds crazy to me. <laughs> that's a really good question, and I know that seems crazy to a lot of people. My life seems crazy to a lot of people, but you know, like you, you even said, worded in the way, like, how do you do it in real life? It's like, to me, that is my real life. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I, going back to that goal thing, right? Keeping in mind your larger picture. Like, traveling is always, that's part of my goals. Like, I love to travel. I love to be on tour. I joke around with people that I feel more at home in a hotel room than I do like in a house. But you definitely have to, I know a lot of touring musicians and a lot of them either like own a home and then they rent it out or they don't have places or they'll like line up their leases or their places to align with their tours and stuff. And then there's other people who like more of a home base and they will have a place and you know, either they own it or they continue to pay rent even when they're on tour because they like the idea of having that stability in that place to go back to. So it, it's really whatever works for you, you know? So, I mean, it does take a, a lot of planning, right? Right, yeah. So. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. How is the, uh, the culture around music different in Japan? Ooh, excellent question. So not only the culture and music around Japan is completely different, but just the culture in general. In general, I would say they appreciate the arts a lot more. Um, symphony orchestras are huge over in Japan. I don't know the number, but just in Tokyo alone, gosh, there's so many professional orchestras, like in one city. So it's certainly a lot different than it is in the US. Um, classical music is huge there. They love classical music. Uh, so from the music education standpoint, music for them is like a club after school. The way they do things in Japan, um, the kids can choose one like activity, you know, band or basketball or whatever, and it's after school. So, but the interesting is, thing is they can only choose one. And the bands there, you would not believe them. Like I have seen junior high school bands from Japan and they sound better than like any high school band in the US. It's really crazy. Um, the culture and work ethic is just very different there. So the amount of time that they spend practicing, I'm sure, at the, at the younger ages um, is way different. In the professional side of things, like I said, they appreciate the arts a lot more. So there's a huge scene for big shows, like a lot of touring productions go through there, um, as well as like big theater shows and stuff like that. They love that stuff there. And then the music scene is, they pay musicians very differently there. You know, here in America, we could do, you know, like gigs at a bar or a restaurant or something where the institution or the bar or restaurant will pay the musicians. But in there, in Japan, it's the patrons that pay the musicians. So I remember my first time I was invited to go see somebody play in Japan. Um, they have these places called live houses. This is where they have live music. And it was like $40. And I'm talking just like, a colleague, you know, not necessarily, you know, anyone who's super famous or anything. I was like, $40, you know, I have friends here who like won't go see a band if there's like a $5 cover, you know, and so it, it's just totally different. They're, the culture is 
in this way where they appreciate the art and the music and they'll pay for it. You know, you go see music anyway, where you're paying 30, 40, or a lot more dollars, if that makes sense. So it's, it's very different. <coughs> Yeah. How's your experience of being on tour and still being able to practice and like if you had side projects? Or oh! How did all that go for you? That's a good question. You just make time in the day. I usually always have side projects going on and of course make sure I have time to practice every day. When I was on tour with Blast this last summer, basically it's like we would get to the theater at a certain time and I had a whole routine from the like second I got into the theater. You know, we would usually get there hours before the show started. And it didn't actually only include a practice routine, it also included a workout routine, you know, so I'd like work out, practice, and it was very, like, every day was exactly the same. You know, do my little routine. And, but then also, I have a silent brass mute, and I took my trombone with me everywhere, so I also played in my hotel room a lot, you know, so you could do late nights, early mornings, just squeeze it in whenever, whenever you can. Um, so having a silent mute is huge play anywhere, anytime. And then utilizing my travel time. So, you know, you could sleep or watch movies or something, or, you know, you could be listening to music, right? Listening to the music you're working on. Um, I also do a lot of arranging, so I would like arrange music, listen to music. You know, you could certainly get in, even if you're not playing your horn, you can certainly get in tons of constructive time while you're traveling, sitting on a bus or a plane or a train or something. So it's really about just Make, making the time, being creative with your time, you know, if that makes sense. So you'd be surprised if you really thought about it, like how much practice time or you can squeeze into the day, you know, so, yeah, yes. Could you talk about building an online presence? Sure. So it's really important now to have a strong online presence. Definitely getting a website out there. Um, do any of you have websites at this point? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so. If you don't have one yet, I would strongly suggest to start thinking about that. Now, you know, websites do cost money. You gotta pay for the domain name and you know, if you have someone design it and all that. So that might be something, for, especially for our younger students, a little farther down the road for you, but start thinking about it now. So with this online presence, and I think this um, applies to like, if you're gonna be a freelancer too, you need to start thinking of yourself like as a product or a brand. Like, you're no longer, well, I mean, you are you. But you have to start thinking of yourself as a product. Like, you have to sell yourself, right? So start thinking, this is other things you can start doing now. Start thinking about what your product is, what you want to sell, who you are, what you have to offer, right? So obviously, you know, collecting things for a website. Um, this other thing that I'm starting to get really into now that was very different when I was your age is social media. When I was younger, I mean, Facebook came out when, for the first time when I was in college. I know, that makes me seem really old, but like, and it was only for college kids. You have to like have a college um, email to even be on it. So people were not using Facebook for business. It was being used just to chat with your friends, you know? Same thing with Instagram. It really wasn't being used for business. Nowadays, I would say it's like the number one way that people are doing business. It's crazy to me, really, how, like big that has grown and how much people are utilizing that for business. So I think that's also important things to start thinking about. Um, something I've been doing recently is I've been switching over, it's still in a process right now, so it's not complete, but switching over a lot of my personal accounts to business accounts and kind of like rebranding my products, right? So instead of my page of you know pictures of my cat and what I ate for lunch and stuff like that, you know, I'm doing more posts about music and trombone and my career and stuff like that. Because this is the way, and this isn't true for every field or every career option within music, but this is the way that people are getting discovered. It's a way for you to showcase what you have to offer. You know, if someone just like looks on your Instagram real quick and sees, oh, there's a video of her playing the trumpet. Okay, that's what she sounds like. Oh, she plays in this band, cool. Oh, I know that guy. Oh, she went to college at this school. It's just a really easy way for people to identify you, see what you do, and know if they want to work for you. I do know, at least with personally, like some of my colleagues, um, there are people who have mixed feelings about this. I know many musicians who do not use social media and don't want to and don't have an interest in it, and they get their work and they do their gigs and they have a good career. 
and then I know a lot who do, and they love it, and they're utilizing it in great ways. So it's just, it, it's really up to you. I would say if you're interested in this kind of thing, start finding people whose careers you want to emulate, or start finding people who like you really look up to, if that makes sense. The easiest place to start is obviously within your own instrument, right? You should already have you know, players you want to emulate for their sound, right? Do we all have our favorite players for our, our instruments? Yeah. So that's a good place to start. Maybe one of your favorite players already has a great website, and they have a great YouTube channel, and they have all this information out there. You know, start following them on Instagram. Start following them on Facebook. See what kind of content they're putting out, and you can kind of use that as an example. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'll go. Oh, could you yeah. discuss your perception of going all in in music that you mentioned earlier? Yes. I think that's a really important thing. Only know about students. five minutes. <laughs> what I mean by going all in. So they say like time is the great equalizer, right? We all only have 24 hours in the day. And there is never enough time. So what I mean by going all in is if you're really, if you're going to make it, you know, make your goal, whatever that goal was, right? Principal trumpet or most awesome band teacher that ever existed, whatever your goal is, if you're gonna make it to the very top, you, you have to go all in, meaning like your day needs to be centered around it. You know, you need to practice as much as you can. You need to take every opportunity that comes up. Every decision you make needs to be based on this goal. And that might mean restructuring your day a little bit or restructuring your life a little bit. When I was here with Doug Yo, I remember him telling me about how he was like spending his money to make sure that he had enough money to buy the trombone record that he needed. Because they couldn't just go online and watch a YouTube video. They had to like go to the record store and like buy the album, right? So he could listen to his you know, favorite artists or whatever. And he was like, yeah, in order for me to save that money, I had to not go out with my friends that one Friday night because I needed to save that money to purchase this thing. So what I mean by going all in is, you know, your goal needs to be the most important thing. And if that means maybe not going to, you know, going out and partying with your friends so you could spend that time practicing, or maybe not buying some new video game so you can instead invest that money in something that's going to help you meet your goal, like, I don't know, you know, you know practice mute or new music or something. That's what I mean by going all in, of this idea that like at some point you have to just be obsessed with what you're doing. You have to just love music and want to achieve your goal and it just has to be your priority. So that's kind of what I mean by going all in. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah? All right. All right so kind of going off the social media question, I yeah. know that some, there's still a lot of professional players out there who don't have a social media mm -hmm. presence, so how would you go about kind of connecting with those people and finding out what they're doing to get where they are. Now. Interesting. Um, well, one, if it's possible, go see them live. Um, if it's not possible, if they're not on social media, they might at least, they might have a website. Um, if they don't even have a website, see if you can track down their email. You know, uh, depending on what organization they're attached to, you might be able to do some digging and find their email address and you can send them an email. Networking in person is amazing, but email is also a good way. Um, don't be afraid to reach out to somebody and send them an email. I emailed Dr. Edwards. I had never met him before, you know, when I came here. So it's like, don't be afraid to send those emails and make connections with people. If you do enough digging, I bet you you can you can find the emails of someone. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So any other questions? I know we're running out of time here. All right. Well, we'll wrap it up with that. Um, thank you all for being here.